Hello and welcome to the, the launch of The Case of the Catalans, edited by Clara Ponsati. Uh, this evening's event uh, is going out uh, on, on Zoom and it's also being streamed through uh, Facebook and, uh, and Twitter. Um, if everybody could just mute themselves for, for, for the moment and uh, then we'll, we'll uh, un unmute our speaker shortly and, and get started. Um, so uh, the, 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 the book, The Case of the Catalans, is just being published just, just now. Um, Clara Ponsati is, is now a member of the European Parliament in Brussels, and she's joining us from Brussels. And with her to, uh, to talk about the book and uh, to possibly talk about his book too is George Caravan, who's the co-author of Catalonia Reborn, which we published a year or so ago. Um, the, the, the event is scheduled to, to last for an hour, so, so Clara and uh, George will be in conversation for the first, first part and then there'll be opportunity for questions and, and discussions, so feel free to put your comments and questions in the, in the chat box if you're, uh, if you're with us on, on Zoom or if you're on, on YouTube or, or, or Twitter. Um, you, can, you can put your comments in there and uh, the, the Lewis team will We'll be cutting and pasting them into the uh, into the chat in in Zoom. So, without further ado, I'll pass over to, to George Caravan. George uh, was a former member of the member of Parliament in in Westminster, um, and one of his many claims to fame was uh, asking a question of uh, Theresa May as to whether or not she would press the nuclear button if she had to. Um, George can maybe tell us a little bit about that in the course of. Uh, Course the proceedings. Anyway, over to you, George. Um, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen, and, and, and hi to Clara. Um, Hello. My microphone is a bit crackly, um, so the uh, the wonderful technical people behind the scenes will let me know if I become too uh, uh, inaudible. Anyway, it's such a wonderful uh, moment to speak to you, uh, uh, Clara. Um, I thought I might begin. Um, just with a little personal note, um, I see you've been a, a, a member of the, the Catalan Parliament. Um, you've been a minister in the Catalan Parliament for education, um, and you're now an MEP uh, in, uh, in Brussels. Um, simple question, what got you into politics? Was it accident or design? <laughs> it was accident. Uh, <laughs> that's a quick answer. I have never been a member of the Catalan Parliament. I was elected to the Catalan Parliament in December 2017, but I uh, uh, resigned my position without even taking it uh, at that point because I couldn't attend uh, the sessions. I was already in exile at the time. Um, uh, what got me into politics? I was, uh, I, I've always been interested in politics. I've always been a committed citizen, uh, but I have not been active in politics uh, for the last uh, many, many years. I was active in activism as a young person uh, in the 70s in Catalonia. Uh, if you take that as politics, that was my you know, my first uh, and unique uh, experience before I accepted to be part of the Catalan government in uh, 2017, tried the, the summer that preceded the referendum. And at that point, I joined the government that was being reorganized to reinforce the uh, referendum agenda because I was a uh, uh, very, um, supportive of the referendum and uh, I felt honored that they asked me to join and I decided to pitch in. You're an MEP. Has, has you, have you been able to do much as an MEP? Uh, as an MEP, well, I've been an MEP since February, which means that I've been mostly a pandemic MEP. Um, but still, uh, Parliament has remained uh, active uh, in many fronts. Uh, so that means that, yes, I have been, I have remained in Brussels and that has allowed me to participate, uh, uh, say, in person in most of the plenaries that, uh, that the Parliament has, 
uh, met since uh, the pandemic started. Um, and I have been, uh, you know, working actively at uh, drafting uh, questions, uh, submitting um, addenda and amendments and all kinds of things. Uh, so in this front, I've been quite active. Uh, and I also have been uh, using my position as an MEP to uh, speak about uh, the issues that uh, concern the, the Catalan cause and to inform other uh, members of parliament about uh, the violations of human rights that are being, that are taking place in Spain. Uh, so that's basically, yes, I'm using my position as an MEP to defend uh, in general the interest of my constituents and at the same time to use it as a loudspeaker for our cause. I like the phrase loudspeaker. Um, there was one little question though about, about being, because I can see on, on my board here that we have lots of people um, from Scotland who have tuned in. Uh, I read somewhere that the reason you are an MEP is because when, um, when Britain left in, in February and the seats were reallocated, the Spanish state got five extra seats and you got one of them. Is that, is that what happened? Yes. I ran in number, as number three in the list that uh, President Puigdemont was having uh, for the Catalan Parliament and that list I uh, got two slots, uh, one for President Puigdemont and one for Conseller uh, Tony Comin. I was number three. Uh, and at the time, we knew that uh, if Brexit uh, materialized, uh, I would be the third. At the time, I thought that be Brexit was going to take longer to materialize, so I didn't give it uh, much of. Well, I just, I just went back to St. Andrews, uh, you know, resumed teaching and I thought I was going back to my life. Uh, but then, you know, it turned out that Brexit was, ex uh, at least the part of Brexit that affected the parliament was extremely swift. And the uh, five positions that Spain uh, was allocated, uh, one of them was, was mine, yes. You're, so you're, you're in fact the only good thing to come out of Brexit. <laughs> Uh, well, that's one good thing to come out of Brexit, you know, I would relinquish my position very gladly if Brexit could be undone, honestly. And I will relinquish it very gladly if Scotland comes back and needs a slot in the European Parliament. Thank you. Well, we, 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 we'll, we'll come back to politics in a bit, but I really wanted to ask you, obviously, about the book. Um, uh, if you could tell us how the book originated, uh, and, and basically what, what you're trying to say, you and the others in the book. Well, this is a book that started uh, a long time ago, uh, before I was uh, in government, when I was a professor at St. Andrews and I was a, a committed citizen that was concerned about the cause, the cause of uh, Catalan independence. Uh, some uh, someday, uh, you know, I was discussing with uh, several colleagues, well, we don't have a book, you know, a short book that uh, explains the case uh, and it would be good, it would be nice to have one, you know, I, just, I, I remember meeting with, uh, I don't know, it was probably uh, Carlos Boy saying, you know, if you enter Catalonia in Amazon, there isn't anything that is, you know, a useful um, tool to explain uh, what the issues are. And, uh, actually, there was very little. Now there is a little more. There is your book, which is very good. Uh, uh, so you know, uh, um, we still. So you know, we started talking, and you know, it was a collective uh, book. Uh, all of us were very busy, so well, we can do this. Uh, you know, we split the topics, and we started working. And most of the materials of the book were finished before. The referendum. Uh, so the, the book was essentially written before the referendum because it was designed as a, you know, as a, as a, as a small book that could explain Catalan independence at a time in which we were very optimistic and we thought that, uh, you know, this was uh, going to make a lot of, uh, that we were really making good progress towards independence and that the world was going to need that book very quickly. Uh, then I got entangled in the 
messy politics of post-referendum and the book sort of lingered a little bit uh, in part because I wasn't, you know, um, doing the wrapping that the book needed to finish and, you know, it took us a while to bump into our publishers to whom I want to uh, express my deep gratitude for a fantastic job. They were enthusiastic about the book from the very beginning, so um, we're very uh, grateful to them. Uh, we hope that this is uh, a good book for them as well, but at this point we are... Um, so after we found a publisher, then, you know, we had to finish it. It took a while and then... <laughs> This book, the book as it is right now, was finished a, um, a little bit more than a year ago in the fall of 2019, right after the the the, uh, the, the trail at the Supreme Court, and that's when I, you know, I gave uh, Gavin and his colleagues the. Uh, material and but then you know uh, the pandemic uh, got into the middle things got uh, slowed down and uh, here we are uh, i think that the book um, although it's outdated in some of the detailed information of what has occurred more recently in catalan and spanish politics it's still we didn't design it as a book to tell people about the details of the last uh, few minutes or the last few weeks. It's a book to more generally explain uh, why Catalans want to be independent and why this is a good uh, cause and why we think that Democrats across the world uh, should welcome this cause as a, as a cause that uh, deserves their support. So, and I think- It's difficult to be on the spot. And it's always difficult to- Give the shorthand version. If I put you on the spot, what is the basic message in the book? Why should Catalonia be independent? Because uh, the Catalans, as any other people, have the right to self-determination. And the Spanish state has failed at providing a democratic uh, uh, environment in which this uh, self-determination can uh, progress. Um, while there is uh, many reasons uh, which are cultural, historical, uh, economical, all kinds of reasons that we developed and argue in the book, uh, the bottom line is the fact that our demand for independence has generated this authoritarian reaction to such demand is in itself the main reason why we need to be independent. I have to say that the, the little book that I wrote um, rose out of me. I was at the second referendum. Actually, I was at the first referendum as well, but I was at the second referendum um, in, in 2017 and saw as an observer and saw what happened on the streets. And uh, my colleague Chris Bambury and I wrote our book um, because we could find very little in English that explained Catalonia to people over here, principally in Scotland. And I originally thought it would just be a retelling of what happened um, in 2017. It was, it was reportage, if you like. But we found we had to explain more and more of the background. And the thing that really shocked me, the thing that, that though I count myself as being interested in politics since forever, the thing that, that really shocked me was that actually in, um, in 78, 1978, um, with the new constitution, um, Spain really didn't become a democracy. It had a veneer of being democratic. But actually, much of the old authoritarian state remained, and a very corrupt, financially corrupt state at that. And that, um, in fact, though there was, a, you know, a, an element of devolution uh, to Catalonia and the Basque Country, um, in fact, um, the state apparatus was as repressive as ever. Uh, and uh, you know, 
that's why I think your, your new book is important because you have to keep on trying to explain to people um, in, in the UK and in Europe that when you go and lie on a beach um, uh, in Spain, um, you are not seeing the real Spain. There is this repression. And in fact, um, just within the last 10 days, um, there have been another wave of arrests, another wave of arrests by the Spanish state of people who took part in the 2017 uh, referendum. So it's not that it's a past episode, it's an ongoing. Um, but, but Clara, I mean, because people wouldn't yet have seen the book, I mean, who else is writing in it? Who else should we be looking out for? I mean, how is the book structured, just to give us an, an inkling? Uh, this is a collective book, as I mentioned. Uh, so the other authors are, um, I'm going to try to keep the alphabetical order. Um, Professor Antonia Bat, who's a lawyer. Um, Professor Enrique Aragonés, who's um, a, an economist and a political scientist. Uh, she was my colleague in Barcelona in my previous uh, academic appointment, in my last academic appointment in Barcelona. Uh, then, um, Carlos Bosch, who's a professor um, at, the uni at Princeton University and a member of the American Academy of Science. Um, Albert Carreras, who is a professor at the uh, Universidad Pompeu Fabra. He's a, an economic historian and he has also been a high officer in the Catalan government with Professor Mascorell in, uh, a while ago in the government's pre-Puigdemont. Pre uh, Jordi Muñoz, who is a political scientist also at the Universidad de Barcelona. And, um, and um, Xavier Cuadras Murató, who's an economist and who did the more economic uh, part of the book. Uh, the book uh, is is a collective book, so in a way we all feel uh, mem uh, co-authors of the whole uh, thing. Uh, but yes, we distributed our the chapters, and uh, basically it has a, chap a general introduction, and then I write a chapter about uh, Spanish institutions and constitution, in which I discuss uh, how the constitution in Spain was uh, drafted and, in, and on what uh, circumstances and I sort of develop the argument that you were making about uh, Francoism sort of outliving itself through the constitution. Uh, of course, I mean, I recommend reading the chapter, it's, you know, uh, when one says Spain is not a democracy, uh, that seems a little bit uh, simplistic. Uh, so it requires some arguments, but I think that we do make the arguments. Uh, then uh, the book follows with a fantastic introduction by uh, Professor Carreras. Uh, it's a historical, you know, it's a very cute, uh, very short, but uh, synthetic and very effective uh, historical introduction, which is always necessary when, you know, when historical nations in Europe claim their rights to uh, return to statehood, uh, we need to make a historical uh, argument and it's important that we do. And I think that that's one of the chapters in which we really succeed. Uh, then there is a discussion by uh, uh, Abad and Bosch on the process of uh, decentralization, how the autonomous regions work, how they fail to construct a federal structure, although in name, uh, or at the origin, they might have seen so. So, that, you know, we always hear, well, Spain is a very decentralized state. You know, why do you need independence? You have, uh, so, you know, the evolution. Well, there is a, a good discussion of how the process started after the constitution and how it got uh, entangled and basically how it failed. Uh, then we have a very nice review of how the politics and the, and the opinion in favor of uh, independence uh, evolved uh, in, poli in Catalan politics in the recent years. You know, the search 
uh, of, for independent support is relatively new and there is always been people in Catalans who wanted independence uh, but uh, it's fair to say that they were politically quite marginal for many years but uh, since 2010 uh, this uh, the independence being the only way we can self-government has become sort of the widespread state of opinion and um, Jordi Muñoz and Enrique Aragonés review how this uh, change came about and they you know they discuss uh, what are the reasons why people have switched from uh, accepting the status quo into supporting independence, how this is related to their identity or their language and you know there is a, a very a rich uh, discussion on that. Uh, then there is the economic chapter in which uh, Quadras Morató basically makes the point that uh, Catalonia is uh, a perfectly viable uh, uh, economy uh, in an independent way and he he even takes you know the the arguments of the economies that made points more contrary to the Catalan independence and he turns them around to show that even with their uh, numbers with their cost benefit uh, assessments uh, Catalonia would be much better off uh, under an independent state. And finally, Professor Roche uh, reviews uh, the state of the art, I would say, about uh, self-determination in international law and in uh, political science. And he makes uh, the point that uh, the right to self-determination uh, for Catalonia at this point is basically an issue of the European Union developing tools for an internal enlargement uh, so that the European Union has to evolve towards, uh, he doesn't use this, uh, the, the term that, um, but basically I think we need to, uh, Europe needs to think of itself as a, Federation not only that adds new members, but also that within the memberships uh, imp generates uh, the tools to uh, relocate uh, statehood inside uh, the union. And he, that's, I think this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good uh, chapter in which um, I think it's the more, I would say, uh, theoretical but at the same time the more um, sophisticated uh, arguments uh, in the book uh, so i think this is the i think i've given a full, a full overview uh, it's a very short book so anybody can can read it <laughs> it takes uh, shorter to read it than me to <laughs> explain it. yeah i suppose i should i should tease you on to the the obvious question what happens next I, you have a theoretically there's an election to the Catalan Parliament in February, mm -hmm. and we have an election also in May. COVID willing, we'll see. Um, but there's an election coming in 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 February. Um, what tell us about the election? What's happening there? What do you think the outcome will be, and how will that impact on um, the Catalan struggle? That's a question that is well beyond the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> caveat here. Uh, so, my co authors don't need to share my views on that. Uh, I'm sure, you know, some, some of it may, but some may not. Uh, so, that's just my uh, personal view. Uh, the good thing about this book is that I think it's a tool for everybody who supports uh, independence or who is curious about uh, why we, for Catalans that support it or our friends in the world that support us, I think it, we hope this is a helpful, it's helpful to uh, explain the issues. Uh, beyond that, of course, um, we did the referendum. Uh, we did a referendum that Spain did not accept. Uh, 
that uh, was uh, not, of course, they did not accept the referendum itself, and of course, they did not accept the result of it. And, you know, a very serious, uh, the reaction of, of Spain was a very serious repression. And the political leadership of that had led the Catalans up until to the referendum uh, didn't, couldn't or couldn't, uh, you know, go on uh, and was, uh, you know, was destituted from government, some were in prison and the others are in exile. Uh, so in a way, you know, the Catalan independence movement in its, uh, you know, as an institutional uh, project reached its limit it's at, uh, in in the fall of 2017, since then, uh, there was another election. There is a coalition government in Barcelona that is constituted by the two big uh, independentist force, Esquerra and uh, Junts. They are in government right now, but there is an election um, scheduled for February because the president was uh, destituted by the Supreme Court because he uh, was daring enough to uh, hang a banner uh, require, uh, supporting the political prisoners. Uh, uh, anyway, so this is another episode of repression. So the, the, we have this government that doesn't have a president right now and is bound to uh, have to, uh, well, we'll see what happens in this direction um, in February. Uh, it's been three years. Uh, the imprisonment of the leadership was a huge trauma, I would say, psychologically for the Catalan people and also for the political leadership. So it, it came as a huge surprise that Spain would act uh, so roughly. And it has taken, uh, you know, three years to sort of come to terms with the fact that Spain uh, is not going to sit and talk. Uh, that Spain is, you know, just going to react uh, repressively. Uh, so in front of that, there is basically two reactions. One is to say, well, maybe it's not time yet. Maybe we're not strong enough to come, you know, to face this, this uh, to face Spain. Uh, and the alternative is, well, we were not smart enough, we were not uh, brave enough or cunning enough after the referendum. We lost an opportunity, but we need to, you know, keep trying and we cannot give up. Uh, so these are basically two main attitudes. I wouldn't call them strategies. These are two main attitudes. Uh, at this point, it's not clear how the electoral proposals fit into these two main attitudes. I think it's still open. Um, Esquerra leans more towards let's wait and see, let's become stronger. Uh, but it's not clear what the alternative is. Uh, and I don't have, you know, the solution to this problem. Uh, so I would give us, you know, some time before the election. I'm pretty sure the election will take place. I mean, after all, you know, America had an election with, you know, many, many, many more people voting across uh, a much bigger place. So I don't think the pandemic is a reason not to, not to hold it. Uh, so it will happen. Uh, you know, what the result of that will be and how this will help or hinder a new stage of our struggle for independence, I think it's still an open question. Uh, right, what we're going to do now, um, Clara, uh, we've got a whole bunch of questions have come in. Uh, so I'm going to move on and take some of the questions. Um, and I have to, because my screen is small, I have to lean forward. So we have a question um, from Villanova, which is really asking us, um, both of us, 
how we see um, the process in Scotland and Catalonia influencing each other, and in particular, um, if, as we hope, because we're quite far ahead in the polls here, we win uh, an SNP government in May, and we force uh, another referendum uh, shortly after that, what impact would that have uh, on Catalonia? So really the question is, Scotland, Catalonia, how do they relate, if at all, and what would be the impact of uh, uh, a yes vote in Scotland on the struggle for self-determination um, in uh, Catalonia? Now, while you're getting your breath, I mean, I particularly do think that there have been a lot of uh, recent um, uh, correspondences between Scotland and Catalonia. I mean, of course, um, as well as the rep repression, one of the great driving forces of Catalan independence was the language question, and that didn't um, impact as greatly in Scotland. Um, uh, but um, I think since certainly um, the great banking crisis of 2008 and the subsequent austerity that was imposed on both uh, across Europe, but also very seriously in Scotland and Catalonia, um, that fused with the national question. And that's what raised um, uh, 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 popular resistance uh, here against London and Catalonia against Madrid um, to majority levels for the first time in a long time. Um, so I think there are, there are, there are significant parallels, um, plus the fact that um, here in Scotland and, to, and in Catalonia there is uh, a European feeling um, that we feel that we're recovering our, our European identity, our traditional European identities, as ancient nations of Europe, which of course we were. Um, so um, the, the, the upsurge in the Catalan struggle up to 2017 and afterwards certainly had an impact on Scotland. It excited the popular imagination here. And all the times I've been across to Catalonia for the various referendums and demonstrations. There have been lots of Scots, and everywhere you went, you would see Scottish flags. And in Scotland, when we have demonstrations, independence demonstrations, you see Catalan flags. Um, so in, in, in many ways, the two struggles have to come together. And I would hope, um, I remember many years ago, a story I always tell, been a long 20 more years ago, 25 years ago, um, uh, I remember, um, chatting to Georgi Pujol when he was um, Georgi Pujol when he was uh, uh, president of Catalonia, and he used to come to Edinburgh uh, for the rugby, and we were having a, a, a pint in in the pub um, just after the rugby, and he was poking me and saying, "Why haven't you got independence? Why haven't you got devolution? Because we didn't have devolution at that time. Uh, why we expected you to be ahead of us? Um, so I feel we need to, you know, we need to." fulfill that promise in Scotland. And if we get independence uh, ahead of Catalonia, then I'm sure Catalonia can expect all the help uh, that it needs from, from Scotland uh, uh, thereafter. So that's, that's my little bit, um, but, but uh, Clara, Scotland and Catalonia. Um, well, I, I think that, you know, Scotland, and Catalonia, I mean, of course, there is the, you know, the popular brotherhood, or, you know, sisterhood. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, very powerful. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, the peoples, the two peoples, uh, um, do feel sympathy and solidarity to each other. That's uh, that's very. I think it's very intense and 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 very important. I mean, the fact that these are two. Uh, peoples that historically had no, not much of a connection, uh, but you know, in the 20th century, we've kind of have recognized each other, and that's I think that's the main, uh, the main thing. The politics is a lot more delicate uh, and not so beautiful. Uh, first. I think the other thing is, well, one thing is the UK and Britain, and the other is Spain. 
uh, and you know, each of us have to face uh, you know a different metropoly, so to speak. Uh, and therefore, the way we approach uh, the struggle for independence is uh, clearly different. Um, in the case of Scotland, of course, you know, Brexit uh, has been a disaster or will be a disaster. It's still not quite there. But at the same time, I think that the feeling of uh, grievance that the Scots feel for their decisions not being, being taken in uh, London about the pandemics, about Brexit, about fishing, about so many things. Uh, that has sort of uh, um, reinforced uh, the independence movement. After all, you did have a referendum in 2014 and you did decide it was not time yet at that time. I mean, but that was a fair referendum. You had a shot, I shot at it. Uh, but now, uh, of course, the circumstances have changed and uh, you're claiming your right to have another one. And it looks like the polls, but never trust the polls. Uh, the polls are, uh, you know, giving uh, strong support to that. Um, so, so we'll see how this uh, comes up. Um, Catalans still have not had a referendum in which the metropoly accepts uh, that that is a legitimate referendum and that they feel committed to accepting the result. So that's, that's, a, that's the main difference. Uh, um, do we feel, um, of course, you know, if Scotland moves ahead, um, I, I mean, this is not a race, you know, whoever gets there first, uh, I hope will help the next. Uh, sometimes things are not that easy. I mean, for the, the Baltic, the Baltic uh, countries, for example, you know, they are countries that are recently independent. In history, you know, 20 years is nothing. Uh, 30 years is nothing. So they do have a recent memory of their independent struggle. So the people also have this uh, natural sympathy. But Spain has managed to manipulate them politically and it's not uh, that simple for these, uh, you know, potential friends to express themselves. Uh, so I really do hope that this doesn't uh, happen uh, for an independent Scotland if, if it, you know, if Scotland reaches the independence before we do. Uh, but uh, one can never be sure of anything. And sometimes I haven't felt uh, enough uh, solidarity. Uh, so, I mean, of course, there is never enough. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so that's how I feel. I have a question. So this is from Jonathan, and he says in Scotland, much of the drive for independence is for different policies than are voted for in England: um, European citizenship, no nuclear weapons, more state-run operations. What sort of political policies does Catalonia vote for that Spain doesn't? So um, aside from the, the the huge question of self-determination and so on. I mean, what, if, if an, would an independent Catalonia have, have different policies in many respects from from uh, existing Spain? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the fact, the proof is that uh, once and again, the uh, limited uh, self-government that we had uh, was, uh, you know, constrained by the interference of the Spanish Constitutional Tribunal, you know, laws about uh, uh, protection of housing protection, education, uh, healthcare, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, climate, uh, you know, it's very clear that the political positions uh, in Catalonia are different than they are uh, in Spain. Uh, and that, um, you know, the choices that Catalonia would make would be, uh, would be different. Uh, I'm not, um, I don't 
I don't want at this point, you know, for example, on migration, you know, welcoming uh, uh, refugees, these kinds of things. Uh, the attitudes are, are distinct, uh, but, uh, you know, the Catalans, uh, the, the present devolution system clearly is, uh, is, is very limited. But even within this very limited uh, system, uh, there is a constant interference uh, from Spain. So, so yes. I, I'm going to be, because, because I believe in, in being a difficult interview, um, this, on question of policy, there's always been an issue I found it difficult to get clarity on. Um, where does the independence movement stand on NATO membership, if indeed it has a, a, a a view collectively. Where, 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 where would an independent Catalonia stand in regard to NATO membership? Uh, I don't think the independence movement as such has a position. In fact, uh, you know, not having a state, uh, some, you know, so in a way uh, condemns you to uh, some degree of naivete and infantilism in many political difficult questions. So there is not a well-developed uh, defense uh, agenda for an independence, for an independent con uh, Catalonia. Uh, my, my personal position is that we should remain uh, in NATO uh, and in the EU. But of course, one, is, one thing is what you wish and the other is what, polit what is politically feasible. Uh, so, but that's that's my, that's my my personal view. I think that many other Catalans share my view, uh, but uh, I don't think the, the the movement as such doesn't have a position. It, the movement, the Cat Catalans, um, more generally, have always. If you ask, uh, you know, the median voter, if there is such individual, uh, is probably more anti-military than, uh, than uh, su supporting NATO would be, uh, you know, and peace movements are very uh, powerful, which is good, but, you know, peace movements uh, have to be accompanied with uh, strategic uh, positions in, in defense. And we live in a world uh, in which uh, you cannot allow yourself uh, naivete when it comes to defense. I mean, it, obviously, the nuclear weapons issue has always been a very central element to the debate over Scottish independence. Uh, um, and the roots of the Scottish National Party and the modern independence movement uh, arose in the 1960s out of um, anti-nuclear protests because Scotland was a base for American nuclear weapons. And subsequently, um, it is a central point of um, uh, the independence movement's platform now, today, that British nuclear weapons should be removed from Scotland uh, immediately after independence. Uh, and I think that, you know, and in fact, that's a, that's a position which is held not just by the independence movement, it's, it's been voted on several times uh, by the Scottish Parliament including um, members of the Green Party and the Labour Party. Um, and it's been supported by um, both the major churches, Catholic Church and Church of Scotland. Um, so it's, it's a defining feature of Scottish nationalism. For those of you who are listening in um, from, from, uh, from Catalonia, uh, nuclear weapons would not be allowed on Scottish soil. Uh, it's just that I thought, I mean, I've always been struck by the fact that defence isn't particularly an issue of debate within the Catalan uh, national movements. That's one way in which Scotland and, and Catalonia uh, differ. Um, another question, I think we've, we've probably got time for another question. Um, this is from Charles. Um, it's a bit of a technical question for Clara. When did Catalonia lose its nation status? And Charles says, I was always of the impression that it was a nation, but the Spanish constitution seems to disagree. Um, so, um, when did you lose nationhood? Did you ever? What's the, what's the historical background to that? Yeah, I mean, 
mean, if you if, if one needs a date, of course, 1714, when you know when uh, Catalans lost uh, the uh, the war of succession, which uh, in which you know the Catalans had supported uh, the non the Habsburg candidate, and Spain and France uh, uh, defeated uh, the Catalans and imposed uh, King Philip uh, V. At that point, Catalan institutions were dismantled. Uh, up until then, uh, you know, there was, you know, it was not quite a modern state, but there was uh, Catalan, you know, instit Catalan institutions that were distinct from Castilian institutions and, you know, whatever state apparatus existed at the point uh, were separate state apparatus. Um, after that, um, uh, you know, the constitution in 74, I could go over, you know, discuss the constitutions in between, like the constitution in uh, 1812, which clearly already ignored Catalans as, uh, as a nation. But, uh, you know, the constitution in, 70, in 78 does not mention Catalonia as uh, Spain is not a United Kingdom. Spain is a Unitarian Kingdom. Uh, that's a, that's also a main main difference. Uh, you know, the crown doesn't deal separately. Uh, and you know, it, I could go on. Uh, it's clear that uh, at this in these terms. And if we go back to our previous question, just for a second, uh, Catalans have never never been involved in the army. They've always been considered as a, as a colony. I mean, not explicitly these terms are not being used, but the fact, uh, the fact that you don't have Catalan officers and you don't have uh, Catalans participating in the army. Of course, the British army and the Spanish army are different things. The Spanish army has been a joke for um, several centuries now, uh, and that's not the case of the British army. But in any case, you know, the history of uh, colonial histories are different. Uh, so all these things uh, have a big impact on how uh, Catalans have matured or not matured uh, their uh, uh, thoughts about defense. I think that uh, the fact that there is a lot of Scots that have uh, that have participated uh, in British defense that uh, that uh, I think that's an asset in a way for you and you have more tools to think about these issues. Right, I, I, we, we, we're coming, coming to the end, I just, I just let me throw one, one, one straight addition of my own on, on this question of, of Catalan uh, nationhood. Of course, after the, the fall of the uh, dictatorship in 1934, Catalans freely elected uh, uh, a government that declared autonomy and independence within a, uh, a, a, a federal relationship with the rest of Spain. Uh, and so, in fact, Catalonia was, had an independent government, was, independent, was an independent state until 1938, uh, when it was invaded by a military, uh, military junta, uh, uh, and the democratic government was overthrown. And uh, it's always seemed to me outrageous that um, whereas the other um, uh, elected governments uh, uh, that were overthrown by the fascist dictatorships in Europe in the 30s have ultimately um, returned to democracy, um, Catalan's nationhood and, and democratic institutions, which were there in 1936, 38, 39, which were overthrown by Franco, who had no democratic legitimacy whatsoever, that, that's been ignored ever since um, by Europe. And I think that is an outrageous thing to say. Um, right, one last question to Clara. I'm sorry, there, there's lots of questions that are now falling in, but we're running out of time. One last question to Clara, which is what I always ask. What's your next book? Uh, well, I am preparing a book of memories. Uh, it will take a while, though. Because, uh, you know, all my, many of my, uh, you know, colleagues, if I may use this term, colleagues in, parliament, in, in government, you know, people who, my, uh, their friends who are in prison and uh, President Puigdemont, uh, they have written several, you know, there's been a lot of books about uh, our recent past, uh, but I haven't uh, yet issued mine. 
Uh, sorry, Bobby uh, <laughs> is expecting me to write that as well. Uh, so, and I have started that, but I have sort of diverged from a book about uh, my uh, my memories of the short, you know, the, the recent past. In and I, you know, I have dived into a much much remote past, and so I need to get back. Uh, and I still, you know, I have a lot of material, and I still don't have something that really uh, uh, can be envisioned as a book that's coming up soon. But yes, I am I'm working on um, on a book about uh, my, my memories of government and of the referendum and the more recent uh, experience, but uh, then I, you know, I just uh, sort of uh, have a, a long uh, uh, zoom back and go back to my grandparents and uh, I'm still <laughs> I'm still reviewing you know my grandfather's bakery and all these things so we'll see how long it takes okay, no, we, look, we look forward to that 